Hey everybody, welcome to Nephrology. We've got a lot to cover in this lecture, in this topic, so let's just dive in. Our first question here is a multiple choice, so as always, go ahead and hit the pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the correct answer. Your correct answer here is B. So let's dive into some of the basics that occur during renal development. Now, in order to capture really easy points on your exam, you want to know the basics of embryology across all the systems. And so in the kidney, let's start by talking about the pronephros, the mesonephros, and the metanephros. So during development, we see three stages through which we will go. We have the pronephros. This is going to be seen during the third week of development, but it then degenerates, and this is a non-functional structure. During the fourth week, we see the mesonephros. Now, this acts as a temporary kidney during the first trimester of development, and it's going to remain functional only for a short period of time, but this does remain as the Wolfian duct. So as opposed to the pronephros, which degenerates, the mesonephros sticks around as our Wolfian duct. Now the metanephros will be seen in the fifth week of gestation and it remains as the permanent adult kidney. Now this develops from the ureteric bud, which is an outgrowth of the mesonephric duct and the metanephric mesoderm, and that is derived from the caudal part of the nephrogenic ridge. Now, the embryonic ureteric bud, this is going to be responsible for the ureter, the renal pelvis, the collecting ducts, as well as the major and minor calyces. The metanephric mesoderm, on the other hand, this is responsible for the formation of the structures of the glomerulus all the way through to the DCT. So this would mean things like the glomerulus and its capillaries, the Bowman capsule, the PCT, the loop of Henle, and of course, the DCT. Now remember that the final thing to canalize during development of the system is the ureteral pelvic junction. As a result of it being the last thing to canalize, it will be the thing most likely to experience pathologies. Okay, now it is also, as a result, going to be the most common pathological cause of hydronephrosis in the prenatal stage. All right, let's move on to the next question. We have another multiple choice. As always, hit the pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. The correct answer is B. So Potter sequence, this is a condition that develops as a result of oligohydramnios. When there's not enough fluid, that fetus becomes compressed. This results in a myriad of consequences, such as flattened face, uh, deformed limbs, but most dangerously is pulmonary hypoplasia, and that's actually going to be the most likely cause of death. Some of the causes of oligohydramnios can include things like bilateral renal agenesis, placental insufficiency, uh, kidney diseases like autosomal recessive PKD, uh, a reduction in renal output, and as, as well, um, obstructive uropathy. And you would see that with things like posterior urethral valves. Now, don't forget, we've got a mnemonic, which is Potter, P-O-T-T-E-R, that helps us remember the main things associated with Potter sequence. So Potter stands for pulmonary hypoplasia, oligohydramnios, twisted face, twisted skin, extremity defects, and renal failure. I've seen this question a lot just over the years, so make sure you know this one. All right, let's do another multiple choice question. So go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. The correct answer here is E. So something really important you want to keep in mind when it comes to the horseshoe kidney is that it is more likely to happen in someone who has a chromosomal aneuploidy. So let's say you see a patient in a vignette with Down syndrome, they've got a higher risk. You see someone with trisomy 13 or 18, they've got a higher risk. Now this is fairly straightforward, but keep in mind that what's happening is that the kidneys are fusing at the inferior poles. And then as they ascend in the abdomen, they're going to get caught underneath that first vessel that they encounter, which is of course what? the inferior mesenteric artery. Now the kidneys still work. Um, you might never know that this is present. However, it could be associated with signs and symptoms that include things like hydronephrosis, uh, renal stones infection, as well that could be associated with an increased risk of renal cancer. Oftentimes though, this happens and we never know. 
All right, let's do some true or false questions, testing our knowledge of renal embryology conditions. So as always, let's do this more in a rapid fire way. So I'll give you a few seconds to read the question and then we will discuss the correct answer after each one. All right, so let's dive in with our first question here. True or false, go. This is true. And the reason why is because that unaffected kidney will hypertrophy to compensate. Now, one thing to keep in mind with this is that while the normal kidney does compensate, anomalies in that normal kidney are not uncommon. So I want you to keep that in mind. All right, let's do the next question. True or false, go. All right, guys, what do you think? This is false. When the ureteric bud fails to develop an induced differentiation of the metanephric mesenchyme, we don't get a smaller kidney. We get a complete absence of both the kidney and the ureter. All right, next question, true or false, go. All right, guys, what do you think, true or false? This is false. The kidney in this case is non-functioning. Now the cause of this is the ureteric bud failing to induce differentiation of the metanephric mesenchyme. This causes the kidney to become non-functional and also consists of cysts and connective tissue. Remember that this is typically going to only be seen unilaterally, but if it happens bilaterally, what condition do you think we can get? We just talked about it, Potter sequence. All right, let's move on to the next question. True or false, go. What do you guys think? This is false. The bifurcation of the ureteric bud actually happens before it enters the metanephric blastema, not after. Now this is associated with an increased risk of UTIs, ureteral obstruction, vesicoureteral reflux, and hydronephrosis. All right, let's go to the next question. True or false, go. Hey guys, is this true or false? This is true. Remember that posterior urethral valves are the result of membrane remnants of the prostatic urethra in males, which is also known as the posterior urethra. On ultrasound, this is identified by either the presence of bilateral hydronephrosis and a dilated or thick walled bladder. Now in male infants, this is going to be our most common cause of bladder outlet obstruction. Now severe obstruction could result in oligohydramnios. All right, let's move on to the next question. True or false? Go. This is false. The most common primary cause of vesicoureteral reflux is either due to an abnormal or insufficient insertion of the ureter within the vesicular wall, or it could be secondary to retrograde urine flow when there is a significant elevation in bladder pressure. Now, recurring UTIs are the big risk that's associated with this condition. All right, let's move on to the next question. We have a multiple choice. So as always with multiple choice questions, we'll give you a little time, hit the pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is D. Now this is a super high yield question. So knowing the course of the ureters is so important and it tricks a lot of students because some students just glance over it because it seems easy. Therefore, it's highly likely to be tested. So let's take a look at what we need to know. Now remember, the ureter arises from which structure? The renal pelvis. Now from there, it travels under the gonadal arteries, then over the common iliac artery, then under the uterine artery or vas deferens retroperitoneally. Okay, that's important to keep in mind. So remember that it goes under the gonadals, then over the common iliac, then under the ure uterine, uterine artery or vas. Now, knowing the three common points of obstruction along the path of the ureter is also very important because it allows us to really easily pinpoint where something could go wrong or where something is going wrong. So you wanna make sure you know these three locations and they are as follows. Number one, the ureteral pelvic junction. Number two, the pelvic inlet. And number three, the ureteral vesical junction. Now, a quick question for you, and I don't want you to look in your books, but try to think about this based on what we just talked about. If we're undergoing some sort of gynecological procedure and we're working near the, let's say, the uterine or the ovarian vessels, what structure is at great risk of damage? This is not a trick question. The answer is the ureters. 
which is why if you know the course of the ureter and its relationship to certain vascular structures, and you're given an anatomy question that's sort of packaged and you know cloaked in a surgical question, you can remember the association, and hopefully, if you can't remember, at least make a solid guess based on knowing this simple, simple anatomy, okay? But I don't want you to guess, I want you to know this stuff. Hopefully you remember this little nugget when it pops up on exam day, because it always seems to. All right, let's move on. Let's do a matching question, and let's match the part of the ureter with its correct vascular supply. Hopefully you guys can figure this one out, uh, but hit the pause button to figure this out, and then come on back and we will discuss. So here are your correct matches. If you have to fix anything, hit the pause button and do so. But sort of piggybacking off of that last question, you need to know which part of the ureter is supplied by which vessel or vessels, because this is super high yield. And another thing that students just overlook, they say, I won't forget this, and then they do. So as I always say, it's easy to screw this up if you gloss over it, but it's also easy to get an easy point if you don't. So remember that the proximal ureter, the part closest to the kidney, is supplied by the renal arteries. That just makes sense. The middle portion of the ureter, this is supplied by the gonadal artery, the aorta, and the common and internal iliacs. And then the distal portion, this is supplied by the internal iliac and the superior vesicle arteries. All right, make sure you know this information because it is easy to gloss over like I keep saying, and I keep saying it because I don't want you to do that. All right, let us take a quick break and then we will move on to the next lecture.